Hey, it's Ronnie Dahl, Four Wheeling Australia. Welcome to Jacob Farm in Adelaide Hills. Uh, another episode from here. There is five in total. This is another one of those. We have another 80 series here, and I believe this guy is a bit of a radio nutter. So, John, step in, mate. How are Ronnie, you, John? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Good to meet you. Likewise. This, this vehicle, mate. Uh, how long you had it for first? Uh, since 2005, I bought that, bought this vehicle. And this is 2018, so 13 years. Well so done. You, you know a lot about, yeah, well, well done on the calculation. What sure. motor? The HDT, so it's the factory turbo motor. Nice. Yep. Uh, so it's a little bit better and stronger than the uh, average diesel motor for them and a bit more power. How many cars have you done in it? She's got 445,000. So you had a rebuild? I've had a rebuild. Uh, after the factory uh, issue of the big end bearing gave me grief and uh, that was at uh, 290,000 that the engine was rebuilt. Okay, shame it wasn't like 300 and something thousand. It sounds better. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still better than what a lot of other people got out of theirs, which was in the, the hundreds mm. before they went. What's the setup for? It's set up for touring. Um, more so than uh, any heavy four-wheel driving, desert so, sort of thing. Mm. Awesome. I'm going to ask you a lot about the radio when we get to that. Yeah, no problems. Is it an auto or a manual? It's a manual. I don't like autos in four-wheel drives. So, thank God it's a manual. <laughs> bar work. We have a Rock Armour bull bar here. We do, yes. Uh, picked that up second hand to replace the aluminium one off of Gumtree. So I had a factory Toyota one on it before? Yes, put in aluminium. Yeah. I like the Rock Armour ones on the 80, so they look nice. Good. We have a worn winch, which is how many pounds? Uh, 9,000. Cable? Yeah, I've stuck with the old steel cable that came on it. I was happy with that. I've not seen a need to change it. Like usual, I've only ever used it to get someone else out, and never myself, so. <laughs> Save me from saying it. <laughs> awesome. Well, yep. you got a lot of stuff in this bar, which we'll get to, because there's a lot going on here with the lights and the, and the yep. UHF and that. You have standard side steps. So I do, yeah. This is a touring just... vehicle, it's not a rock hopper. No. There's no need for those. That's right. Well, let's go to the back because I believe you have a bit of you have a bar on the back. Yes, we do. We have a uh, Nato bar by Rock Armour, but sold to me by Powerful 4x4 in Queensland. Carries both my jerry cans, or I can swap the jerry cans out for water, depending on whether I need the extra fuel or extra water for a trip. And carries the second spare tyre here with the main spare. Still underneath, so I two still spares. carry two spares. Yes. Nice. The other good thing I like about this uh, unit is that it's actually got slam catches on it. So oh, slam it's catch. A, a lot easier to uh, open than the yeah, uh, cantilever yeah. that you've got to reach underneath for. All right. So we and just basically just, yeah do that, and we're done. Beautiful. I like that fact. It's one of their uh, redeeming features on this uh, unit, I reckon. Originally, it had safety pins to lock in there so that you couldn't accidentally knock the uh, catch open, but I've never found that I've had an issue with the catch coming open, so I always left them out, and then they'd always bang on the bodywork, so okay. they disappeared. I just haven't got around to removing the cables. Yeah, I can tell you're well-travelled, so you've been on corrugations, it doesn't come out, so... Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, let's talk about your fuel capacity while we're on jerry cans. So you've got two on the back, which is 40 litres. Yep. Um, that's another calculation. Well done. Very, very good. <laughs> yes. Uh, a lot of mass being involved today. How many, how many tanks have you got? I've got the two standard tanks. So the original tank is a 95 litre with the uh, sub tank still underneath uh, at 50 litres. Okay. It gives me around about 180 litres. In kilometres? Not quite sure of my Ks, but I usually out in the desert regions and that average around about 14 litres per hundred. That's not too bad. It is. It's pretty good. Given the amount of gear in the car. Yes. Yeah. And it's including with the rooftop tent and all the other stuff that I usually carry. Nice. Bin bag on the back. Rubbish bag. Yes. Uh, just a recent purchase from King's. Uh, the last one I had on the last trip down the hay. 
the zipper broke and it was more problems than getting a zipper fix than it was just to buy another one out of bag. <laughs> Fair enough. The throwaway society. It's become that way. You tow? I do. I've got a small camper trailer sitting at home, but uh, that's only taken into the easier areas where we're basically going to do some base camping and travel out from those points. That thing up there? Yes. Um, the roof rack is a combination of uh, roof rails and a uh, roof basket. The Rhino rack rails with a, a track lander basket that's been cut down to suit for the rooftop tent. And uh, with the Rhino rails, it allows me to actually mount a lot more stuff off the system rather than trying to find harder ways to mount stuff. I'll see what you've done. Oh, yeah. So you've got the basket and you can still mount the shovel off the rail. Yep. You've got the awning off the rail. Yep. And the other side is the same, obviously. Got an awning on the outer side as well. And uh, like a GPS receiver for the HF radio mounted on there and all that sort of stuff. You have to explain to me what that means when we get to the comms. We will do. Rooftop tent, what is that? It's an ARB rooftop tent. I uh, yeah, picked that up um, second hand. Uh, a guy was trying to sell it and uh, $800 for an ARB rooftop tent that had only been used for 10 days was a bargain and it also came with the little room that goes on the back. Oh nice, very nice. You run the treads? Well, not exactly. They're an, what's called an X-Bull. Uh, saw them on uh, YouTube, uh, a guy in America was parking an F100 on them and uh, that sort of thing so I thought I'd give them a try. Oh, so they're not treads, they're X ball. Yeah, this awning on this side's a very early old version of the awning. And uh, I've managed to keep that because occasionally when a mate comes with me, he'll swag on this side and we can still do stuff on the other side under the outer awning and mm. uh, allows us to uh, cater for extra people. Nice. When you pull the awnings out, do you put a side wall on it or do you put like I a... do have two side walls, uh, but I haven't had a great use for them yet. Uh, I do do it, and uh, just to add the extra shade when the sun's far over on an yeah. awning and the sun's still trying to beat in on you on the uh, back side of the awning. Lights and comms, and there's a bit to talk about here. We'll start with the communications. You know what? We should start with the lights, because that's quicker. Okay, let's start with some lights. So, are these halogen? Uh, no, they were originally halogen, but they've been upgraded to uh, HIDs. Do you have any watts? Uh, 55 watts, at uh, 6,000K. How far do you see? guess it's probably around 800 metres. Okay, so far enough. Yes. And this is your spread? That is also uh, a spread. Uh, I've got that wired up on a freeway switch inside the cab, so depending on what I'm doing, it's uh, mainly set on the high beam. So it comes on with the high beam, but if I'm doing slow work through uh, windy tracks or something and don't need the high beam on, I can actually uh, flick the switch down and it'll work on the low beam as well. Excellent. That's a good idea. Not pushing too many watts through there. Drawing too many amps? No. Your headlights, are they standard still? Uh, only got the upgraded globes in them. So the uh, high beam internal ones are 100 watters rather than the 55s and the outside ones are the uh, blue ones that have got the extra power output, 120 plus. So you doubled the wattage on those headlights. Do they double in light, thrown out? Not really. It gives you extra range, but I don't feel that it actually throws it any. All right. A little bit further, but it, it makes not, them, not a long way. It makes them acceptable? Uh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Not candle lights. Now onto the interesting stuff. The radios, so let's start with the basic one. So you have this aerial here, I got sick of replacing the AM FM car stereo aerial <laughs> because you go down the narrow tracks and you hit it on the bush and time after time. So Off in the goes. end, I found this little whip that you can almost tie into a knot and that now deals with uh, any bushes and everything else. So it does nice. the same job. That's a good alternative, actually. That's, that's really bendy, eh? 
I noticed you've got two UHFs on the roof here. So you, do you have two radios? I do. I've got two electrophone radios, and the choice of having two of that is if you're in a convoy and, like, you know, out in the Simpson Desert or something, they'd like you to stick to Channel 10. But when you've got a convoy of five vehicles and you're out there and you're listening to uh, Channel 10, you want to we keep find it, it better to keep it clean. So yeah. our group will stay on a different UHF channel and I'll monitor Channel 10 on the second radio, allowing us to com converse without uh, interrupting other people. You used to have those on the bar? Yes, I've had a UHF aerial on the bar, but fine, and uh, was actually told as well that uh, after many breakages that the vibration in your bar will actually break a UHF aerial. So the good thing about moving it up the top as well is it'll give you better range forward and back, where on the bar it'll only sort of give you good range out to the front. Yep, and that's yep. why I've been mine to the top too. We're starting to see more of that now, which is good. Um, we do a lot of tag-alongs where you know, on corrugations, they end up rattling and they start twisting loose and then all of a sudden, I've got to stop and get my radio. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my, we my antenna. Coming down the Hay River track uh, earlier this year and a guy had his aerial on the front there and with the vibration and his dash cam, we watched it actually vibrate itself to death until it actually just fell over. Just snapped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now to the real interesting stuff. This is an auto tuner for a radio. That HF is correct. Yes, radio. it's a Kodan uh, auto tuner for a HF radio I have in the uh, truck. And my HF radio is there. I can log in and do daily logs, allowing people to know that I'm still traveling fine. Uh, it also allows me to make telephone calls. It also allows me to send very short SMS messages to mobile phones. How many characters? 64 characters. So it is limited, but still allows us to send a short message saying, we're all right and we're currently at. Awesome. Yeah. This GPS unit, is that part of the first thing you mentioned? Like you can send... Yeah, so know, right? I can also send uh, GPS locations and uh, when we set it up, it goes to an email address and from that email address, we can actually forward that on to anyone that's uh, following our group. So if I've got a convoy of five cars and uh, five different relatives to, for them to send them to, we can uh, send a GPS location and they can look at the uh, GPS on their location on their computer and uh, actually go to Google Maps and see exactly where we are. So it's a lot like the spot, the spot locator? Very much like a spot locator, um, except it's done via HF radio and not via satellite. And it's free? It's not quite free, but it's well, a lot cheaper than yeah. the other. So mm. with the membership, um, which costs me, say, $100 a year, and I can make uh, 30 minutes of phone calls a month. I can send uh, 30 text messages a month and uh, unlimited GPS logs. That's, that's pretty good. This one here is a spare one? That's correct. So if um, all the corrugation and everything else, as I was talking about aerials on the bull bar, if the corrugation takes its toll on the auto tune, I do carry an old uh, multi-tap whip which I can put into there and use in place of the auto tune if it fails. So what John is saying is, um, for those who don't quite understand HF radios, which uh, most people wouldn't, this is an auto tune, so it tunes automatically. It's for your computer, right? Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Uh, it's like your stereo, your radio. You search for a channel. This one here, however, you have to move the pin up to that is correct so mm. if i want to listen to a certain channel i have to get out move a wire into a special plug for that channel where with this one here i just hit a button on the radio and it tunes it in for me that's actually a really good idea because you hit a root this will probably yeah if you hit a root at that height oh yes uh, yeah. that can happen too if you hit them when they're in full bound yeah that's it good stuff one last thing this right here that right there, that little bit of steel that's sticking up, uh, hidden in the corner, is actually for my sand flag. That is, a, I've never seen a fitting like that, so... No, let's, it's homemade. Let's a lot of my stuff is homemade. Okay, so my sand flag's made up of uh, just some PVC pipe. I've um, got the wider end here as well, which allows me to actually store it a bit easier, and then it'll go together. Unravel, and then it just sits over the nice top. It's done. 
and I suppose if you hit something hard enough, it just disconnects you. It'll sort of disconnect, snapping. yeah. That's a good idea. Now, obviously, you'd only use this in the desert, so you wouldn't use it under dense tracks of trees and stuff because they serve no purpose there. I've used it on Goog's track and um, yeah, found that it catches the trees on that track. Yeah, there's a few trees on that one. Yeah, there is. Fun track, that one, actually. Tires and lift. Let's talk about your red donuts. The red donuts, yes. The red donuts. A bit dusty on the uh, road coming in here to Jacob Farm. I have 15 inch rims. I have a set of six so that they all match. These are the standard. These were an issue that came out as a special for Toyota, I believe. Mm. And uh, I'm running the Toyota AT2 Open Countries. What size are they? These are a 31 inch. I'm pretty well standard. Here in South Australia, we're limited to how much we can lift a vehicle. Yeah. We can only do a 50 mil lift overall. So if you put two inches of lift in your springs and all that, you can't really do tyres unless you go and get it uh, engineered. Yeah, fair enough. So I've stuck with the original tyres. And most of your stuff is touring, so... It is. I have not found it. I've had a real issue with clearance or anything. How many Ks you done on this set? Hard to know. I can't tell you off the top of my head um, because I have actually got multiple sets that I rotate. So to keep a certain set of tyres for tripping and uh, a certain set to wear down on the road. So ah. I sort of lose track of how many Ks I've put on a set of tyres, but the original one was only half worn after doing about 44,000 Ks. Nice, and the same same brand of tyre? Yes. So you, you obviously rate these tyres if you've gone them again? I have. I mm. don't mind them. I think that they're actually reasonably good value. Uh, believe it or not, it only costs like 220 to get a tyre. Yeah, of this size for that size for that. is cheaper as well though. Yes, so my lift is a two inch lift that I've got on this vehicle. It's a combination of springs. There's Dobinson springs on the front, which were just a standard two inch lift. Uh, Dobinson twin strut uh, shocks all the way around. And the back rear springs are actually a old man EMU 200 kilo constant weight spring to help okay. keep the back end level when I'm fully loaded. So you found that that was the best spring for the weight? Currently, at the moment, I'm deciding that uh, no, I need to actually move up to maybe a 300 kilo. On the last trip, when I was fully loaded, I was finding that I was getting a little bit of ba uh, bottoming out okay. on um, some of the rougher dunes as we were trying to Finding go through all the wallows. A bit, bit off yes. than it should be. Yeah. Fair enough. No airbags, no nothing in there? Just no, nothing like that. Just a standard spring, 200 kilo spring. We're now looking at the 80 series motor. It's a uh, HDT factory turbo motor, 4.2 litre diesel. And had a rebuild at? 260, no, 290,000, sorry and uh, done by a friend of mine, James, after many quotes and everything from engineering that do rebuild some motor, and it was gonna come in at 13, 14 grand, because they wouldn't Ooh. do it without touching all the injectors and the injector pump and mm. everything else. Um, we managed to get away with actually rebuilding the motor for about two eight, <laughs> believe kidding. it or not. No, Cause, no. Because your mate helped you? Because my mate helped me, yes. Nice. That's a good motor. And, uh, he took this on because he wanted to rebuild a motor. And the good thing about doing that now is he's had to rebuild his own motor in a FTE 100 series. So he got his experience on mine and gone ahead and rebuilt his. So there's a bit of a story about that catch can you got there. Yes. So when my mate rebuilt the motor and we um, were figuring out that when we got up to about 100 kilometres an hour on the open road and that, that uh, the car seemed to disappear oil. We weren't losing big clouds of smoke of oil or anything out the back and uh, we couldn't figure out what was going on. So we came up with the idea that we'll chuck a catch can in and um, we fed that catch can into a uh, collecting bottle. We did 100 k's out on the open road at a 
100 kilometres an hour and uh, it was a one litre bottle and we thought we'll go and see how much oil we've collected <laughs> and we filled a one litre bottle of oil. Wow. Something not quite right there but so it was a bit hard every 100 kilometres having to drain this one litre bottle back into the engine so we come up with another idea which my mate engineered and that is on the turbo return pipe he uh, brazed in a connector and the catch can now actually returns back to the sump via the turbo return line. No way. And now we don't have any issues with disappearing oil. Diff breathers, uh, we've put them up here nice and high. They both uh, front and back diff. We uh, thought that we wouldn't worry about the transfer gearbox because they run quite high up the back of the firewall anyway. Two batteries. Is there uh, another one in the back? No, I'm only running the two batteries. I find that because most of mine is touring and I don't spend a lot of time in one spot, that the two batteries actually do a good enough job. It's just a, an old alternator in here. And with the old alternator, they were an 80 amp alternator, which we've actually changed for a 105 series, which uh, gives us about a 120 amp. And that uh, keeps it going quite well. That's a massive through. difference. It is a big difference. 40 amp difference. Yes, yeah. Another calculation. But you see, back in those days when they built these, there wasn't all the electronics on those car these cars as there is these days. Yeah, true. And uh, needing bigger alternators to keep all those electronics running. Mm. One thing I'll notice here, you've conveniently put some spare fluids in around here. Yes, I carry uh, two one litre bottles of oil in the front there. Not that I really need to use them much, but they're sitting there. Chain and barrel, you got a chainsaw? Oh yes, I do have a chainsaw. Nice. Uh, that sits at home, but uh, I never take that camping with me. I've got another little saw that I take camping with me, which is, runs off a battery. Uh, in the back, uh, some ATF uh, there for power steering or if uh, someone else that's traveling with us has an automatic and it gets a bit low. And there's also a little bit of brake fluid there for um, the clutch or uh, brake boosters if uh, we need to top them up. Nice. I like the way you run everything neatly at the back there. Yeah, I run all the cables over the back rather than across the front here because if Worst case scenario, you have a frontal impact and with cables across the front, uh, those cables might actually get shorted out and may cause a fire. So my thought was to run them across the back and uh, keep them out of the way. Good idea. Gas struts? Yeah, they're um, an eBay strut from a company called Matchit. Uh, as uh, the old struts wouldn't keep the roof up uh, on, they, above they, your head when you were working under yeah. the bonnet. And they fit on the factory holes? Yep. They are um, designed to fit directly into factory. Beautiful. It's a sunny's on, sunny's off kind of day. It definitely is. The axe. It's just a standard old hardware Bunnings axe, um, mainly used for splitting up some firewood uh, to um, make more kindling or make it a bit smaller. From your chainsaw? No, I don't actually carry a chainsaw. If you reach into that back corner here, there's a oh, recip saw. Recip saw, yeah. Yep, so between the recip saw and the pruning blades, cuts through firewood very well. Nice. And the other thing is that parks don't complain so much about the noise from one of them as they do from a chainsaw. Yeah, fair enough. Custom drawers? Yes, I made them myself. They're made without slides, so it allows me to give a bit extra storage. Uh, bottom one here is all my food and everything else when we go away. Top one here is the camp kitchen. So, got all the stuff there for cooking and eating and everything else. Down here in the bottom one, we've created a spice rack as well. So. Oh, I like that. That's nice. Cool. Better be spice you can think of in there. Just about. What size is the fridge and what is it? It's a 40 litre Waco fridge here in the back, which is my primary fridge. I do have had a little 30 litre fridge behind the driver's seat. Uh -huh. we'll so that's just so that when we run two fridges, um, you know, I will might put this as a freezer at some point or just run this with all the primary meats and everything else in it. And the other one is the drinks fridge. Cool. So, I like what you've done with the rack up there. So yep. you've modified the 
the um, well, if we take the ladder out the barrier because right. I'm so small I need a ladder to get up to my rooftop tent so what we did was we just made a little shelf here that actually attaches to the um, cargo barrier and the cargo barrier has actually been cut down to allow me to access stuff from behind the passenger seats as well when you flip them down yes so, so you have double access you so you've done it because you got stuff behind there yes i can show you that if we move one of the seats forward yeah sure later on cool. but uh, the way i've designed this is that uh, there's a full draw system here in the front there's a couple of alcoves like where some snap straps are kept and uh, the air pump because i don't have an under bonnet one i have a portable one so that sits behind there in behind this fridge this uh, is actually slidable and in behind under there there's an outer floor and underneath that is all where my tools are kept carry a lot of collapsible stuff here uh, collapsible bucket collapsible sink and even a collapsible dish rack this all your water you carry no, I um, haven't got it with me today, but uh, depending, I can put an extra jerry can of water yeah, into the right. rear wheel carrier, but if I need the extra fuel and the extra water, I have a bladder that actually sits on the floor behind the, on the passenger. Wheel. Yes. Nice. How many litres is that? That one's 60 litres, and it's not a full-size one because I carry a fridge on one side, and then the 60-litre one sits on the floor side, on the outer side. We try to use every single here. spot. What, what is up here? Okay, so the idea of that actual rack that I put up there oh, it's a chair. is a chair. There's also a foldable table. There's two chairs up there, a foldable table, and allows me to store added items up there. Nice. And allows me to actually uh, get a chair out easily without having without to move anything there. out. First out, last, last in. in. Yeah. That's the number one packing tip, actually. The other thing I carry is a uh, food vacuum sealer on trips which allows me to buy meat at a supermarket when we're in town vacuum seal it to give me a bit of extra life oh, let's get out of this wind though oh, yes that's better a wind tunnel in this valley we have a sub tank fuel gauge up there working down and an altimeter is this standard with the GXL it is okay yep that is standard. I don't know why they've bothered about that. Why to know what your height is, but they did. At what point does the parachute come out? Uh, probably at about 10,000 feet. <laughs> Moving on down, I run a little uh, solar-powered tire pressure monitoring system, which is just stuck to the window and charges, as you can see, via solar power. Nice. What brand is that one? I'm not sure of the brand, it was just an eBay one and I've had it on for 12 months now and she's done quite a few trips and uh, she's been quite good. Moving, Moving on down, I've just got a little um, camera. Sometimes I film some of the stuff we're doing. Not to your quality, I'm afraid, but it does me. And then moving on down again, I've got a multitude of GPSs. Got an old style GPS that does have a little bit of uh, sat nav uh, built into it like the others. What but does it show on the screen? Does it show a map or? It can show maps as well as uh, doing waypoint logs and um, giving you an arrow to go to a waypoint and the like. So I run the HEMA HN7 as my primary GPS and I run a uh, eBay GPS with uh, Aussie Explorer. I run, um, especially around this area, some high definition uh, topographical maps where uh, this one here will show you a basic topographical map where that one is the full topographical map. The other reason I like that too is if you run one in topographical when you're out touring and the other one in uh, HEMA track maps, you find that there's some information on one and not on the other. Yeah, yep, to show. Radios. Okay, the, um, this old UHF here is fitted in that is it. Yes, that's the microphone for that one. That one's getting on quite old. Electrophone. How old is this one? Let's see. It could be about 20 years old. So it's a 40 channel, obviously. It is a 40 channel. Is this a 80 channel, this one? It can be programmed for an 80 channel. 
but currently 40. Currently still 40. Haven't got around to reprogramming it yet. The other one here is my Kodan radio for my HF communications. Nice little unit that sits here with a remote head with the main unit in nice. the back area. How often on a trip would you use it? I use it uh, quite regularly on my trips. I'll do a log in every night, and that way the people that are running the base skeds will know where I am. And then I also send a GPS log so that uh, fam family and friends will know where we all are. Where we are roughly here in the Mount Lofty Ranges, I've spoken to Perth Base quite regularly. Awesome. And uh, there's also a base up in Kununurra in the top end of WA, and I've spoken to them too through that. As well over 3,000 k's. Yeah. All depends on what the weather's like and uh, how much bounce you get off the atmosphere with your radio signal as to mm. how far you can get. Do you find overcast is better or worse? The clouds actually don't do a lot to it. It's uh, the radiation and the charging of the ionosphere up higher where your signals actually bounce off of. Ah, uh, okay. Learn something new every day. Hmm. These switches are your lights and... Why yes, um, this one here is for the uh, HIDs on the front. I have a set of uh, little LED lights on the rear of the roof rack, which is I use for setting up camp or the likes. Oh, yeah, I saw those, yeah. And these ones here are the isolators for the fog lamps in the bull bar. This one here is the freeway switch for the LED light bar, which allows me to have it in the up position and work with my high beam. Turn it down into the low position and it'll work off my parker lights, allowing me to actually use less lighting, but uh, plenty of lighting to set up a camp or something at night. There's an isolation switch just here, which is for the inverter in the back, because inverters will drain your battery if they're left connected full time yeah. and not being used. Down here by my knee is a, a turbo timer. I've got one of them on here just so that if we've been working the car hard and I pull up, I can let it idle down and walk away from it. Four-way charger there when you've got a teenage daughter and she likes all her gizmos and you're trying to charge your phone, at least she can charge hers and uh, leave that in peace. Fair enough. You, you mentioned a subwoofer under the seat? Yeah, I've got an under seat subwoofer, which is Ooh. one of my favourites. Um, is that a mag light? It is a mag light. Oh. That is an old mag light. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. would have bought that in around about 1986. 1986? When, when I was in the CFS. And the only thing that's been changed on it is it's had a um, LED globe put in it. Yeah, okay. I was going to ask how your saw heads have been on the end of this. Q&A time, eh? Let's do it. You've had this vehicle for 13 years? That's right. That's a, that's a first stint with a vehicle. Can you tell us what has been the, the biggest problem with, with the vehicle? We start on a negative, end on a positive. I think we already brushed over that, and that was yeah, having the motor, the motor let go at uh, 290,000 kilometres. Um, Anything else? No, not really. It's uh, been pretty reliable, apart from that Huffman, issue with yeah. the motor. And what's been, what's been really good about this vehicle? What's, is anything that surprised you? It's ability off-road for a stock standard vehicle. It is uh, quite capable in a lot of sort of terrain and everything else. Uh, um, I haven't had any real issues uh, getting into most places with it. Preferred terrain. Not talking about destination, just terrain. What do you like driving on? I like sand dune and that and the Simpson Desert, that sort of terrain out there. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Sand dunes. What would be your favourite destination then? Probably out there as well? Madigan yeah. Line, something like that? Well, the Madigan Line's pencilled in for 2020 for me. Nice. Um, we just completed the Hay River track in July and that was great. It's getting out oh. there and yep. not... So you went all the way? Yes, we worked our way out to uh, Dalhousie Springs, had to go for a regular soak in Dalhousie Spring, out to Alice Springs and then out through the East McDonald Ranges and came in from the top and headed south down the Hay. Very nice. So if your mate came to you and he said, look mate, I've just born an 80, same year as yours, same engine, same everything, what do you recommend I do to it first? 
My recommendations would probably be put a two inch lift in it and uh, just get it tuned as well for the turbo and the diesel. Just to get that a little bit more out. Yeah, just get that right, yep. And what are your top three favourite mods on this vehicle? Would the radio be one of them, the HF? No, I wouldn't list that as in the probably top three. Yeah? Uh, my um, top three would be the rooftop tent, the, believe it or not, the subwoofer, because that makes such a difference to your listening pleasure when you're out on the tracks. And the uh, third one would be the draw systems in the back. Which you did yourself, DIY. Yep. You've done a good job then. You like it that Thank much? Thank you. I like the spice draw, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's handy too mm. because, uh, yeah, you'll go over there, open it up and go, D -d 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 oh yeah, a little bit of cayenne pepper on today or something. What made you get a HF radio and not a satellite phone? I think the thing that drove me towards the HF radio was that my interest in radios from way back when the original 27 meg CB came out. And um, the thing I do like over a sat phone is I can actually have a listen in and hear what other people are doing and where they're traveling i can also get an update from them about what the road condition or what problems might lay in front of us e.g if they've had a lot of rain in a certain area and someone's come up on the radio and said okay we're here now and uh, we've been rained in you're not going to get that on a satellite phone no. unless you're looking directly to try and find that information they may have their phone on facing the right way, all that. Yeah. That is a really good point, actually. It's more of a network, isn't it? It is a network, so it allows you to hear what is going on around you. And the good thing about that is someone might come up on the network to say that uh, I've broken down at um, such and such a location in the Simpson Desert. Oh, hang on, we're crossing the Simpson Desert. We'll head over to you and give you a bit of a hand. And if they did that by satellite phone, you wouldn't know they're out there. That is something I've heard a lot as well. When I used to have my HF radio, that's what, um, that's what most of the guys were talking about. Someone's broken down, you bring a spare part in for them because you're crossing through. Yeah. So in that yeah. sense, it's pretty, pretty handy. But you have to be part of that network, I was. Well, I, as I say, I'm actually a part of two networks, so I just happened to listen in on two networks. Ah. So doubled the chance. Nice. Name three things that you've done to the vehicle that didn't work out and you've, and you've changed. I'm very particular about how I look at things and I can't say that I've had too much issue with something that hasn't worked. Mostly done my research and I'm quite happy with everything that we've done. There you go. Do your research. Any advice for modifying an 80? As in like, how, how do you find out how to get the right things? How have you done your research? A lot of searching on the internet. Googling will give you a lot of answers to what people have done and have failed with. Uh, the other thing is Facebook. On the uh, 80 series web pages, people will post what they've had success with, what they haven't had success with. What's the 80 page called? Um, there's two actually. 80 series owners? 80 series owners and there's Australian 80 series owners. So ah. there's actually two. One based mainly just for the Australian market, but the other one is open to across the world so you'll get posts from those in america and indonesia and places nice. like that all right john no thanks worries. for bringing the thank ADM. you ronnie i've enjoyed it and thank you no worries and uh if you'd like to know more about this 80 in detail there is a web page for it up in one of these corners and you can subscribe down here if you'd like to support the creation of content like this and other modified episodes and all the other stuff that we do on this channel ronnie dale sorry patreon dot com slash Ronnie Dale. I got it right this time. Kind of. Another video down here, another 80 series, and thanks for watching. Cheers, mate. Cheers.